Well, it looks like we got some stragglers coming in back there. <clears throat> hey, you guys are 10 minutes into my time back here. Let's get going. I got stuff to say. comes in and three leaves. I don't know if this is good or not. <laughs> All right. Somebody want to punch my buttons up here? And we'll... What? Oh, goodness. <laughs> All right. Looks like I got some editing to do. All right. Well, it's good to see you folks here this morning. If you got your Bibles with you, uh, go ahead and turn over. You're going to need it at least two fingers, maybe three. I need to go to Joshua chapter 14 and then Numbers chapter 13 and 14. But if you got a good Bible like mine, they're all on the same page. So, Joshua what? 14. So I was praying about what to teach in Sunday school this morning. And uh, I had a plan, and that's kind of the problem sometimes when you have a plan and then you start praying and God gives you another plan. So we're going to get God's plan this morning and not mine. But uh, anyway, I want to talk to you this morning about my hero in the Bible, Caleb. And so we're going we're gonna to kind of get a little background on him here, and then we'll read the passage in Joshua. But without a doubt, Caleb is my hero in the Scripture. And I mean, I know a lot of people like David, and he's a good guy, and, and Solomon, and, you know, different ones, Ezra, you know. But Caleb's my guy. And I think the reason for that is, is every time I read and study about Caleb, he reminds me of my grandfather because of his ability at his age to just do things that most people at that age wouldn't be able to do. And my grandfather was a, was a man like that. Caleb, at least in my mind, embodies everything that a man should be. Here's a guy that I doubt even understood the dictionary definition of fear. It wasn't something that he ever, ever felt. The name Caleb comes from a Hebrew word meaning dog or to yelp or to attack. I think it's a very fitting name for this man of war that we're going to talk about this morning. He was what today a lot of us would refer to as a junkyard dog. I mean, he was, <laughs> he was ready for the fight at any moment. He was just that kind of a guy, totally fearless and ready to rumble at the drop of a hat. So you should be in Numbers chapter 13 right now. We're going to look at verses 26 through 33. I just want to give you kind of a background of, of my man Caleb here. Verse 26 says, And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation and shewed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sentest us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. 
and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants and the sons of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. That brings us to chapter 14, where we're going to look at verses 1 through 9. And all the congregation lift up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation and said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in, the, in this wilderness? And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land to fall by the sword, and that our wives and our children should be a prey? Were, were it not better for us to return into Egypt? And they said one to another, Let us make a captain, and let us return into Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel, and Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it, it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bred for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you that you give us examples of men and of women in the Bible, Lord, that stand up. Have no fear, Lord, because you are with them. And Father, I pray for us here in your house this morning as we hear this message. That, Father, we would learn from it some things that we need to have in our lives so that we can be like Caleb and we can be like Joshua. We can be like Deborah in the book of Judges and so many others in your word, Lord, that just took a stand trusting you that what you promised you would fulfill. And Father, as we look at this, this man Caleb this morning, I just pray, Father, that you would touch all of our hearts, open the eyes of our understanding, Lord, that we can receive what you have for us this morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Joshua and Caleb, if you remember the story, and they went in to spy out the land. There was 12 spies that went into the land. When they came back, they was the only two that said, we can take it. Don't worry about it. God's with us. He's already given it to us. The victory is ours. I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself this morning, folks, but I want you to understand this morning that the victory is already ours. There's still some battles to be fought, but the victory is ours, and our victory is in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
But Joshua and Caleb was the only two out of that whole generation that actually went into the promised land. So when we get over to our text in Joshua, Caleb is wanting his inheritance because God had promised it to him. The problem he faced was that there were some giants that had a stronghold right in the center of his inheritance. These was the same giants that the other ten were said, hey, there was giants in the land. Uh, we couldn't possibly take that. There's giants in every land. But God is bigger than the giants. We have that same problem in our lives. God has made us promises. And as we move forward to try to claim those promises, Satan will put giants in our way. Yes. Now, we're probably not going to run into some guy that's nine foot, six inches tall and weighs 600 pounds. Our battle today, my friends, is not physical. The Bible tells us very clearly in Ephesians chapter 6 that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our battle is in our mind. That's why there's so much junk on the radio, so much junk on TV, so much junk on the newsstands and the grocery stores. It's your mind that Satan is trying to destroy. He doesn't care about your body. It's your mind. We have the giants that we face too. So what I want us to learn from Caleb today is how to slay the giants and claim the victory over the stronghold. We want to look first at Caleb's character and then at his challenge and finally at his conquest. So let's start out with his character. You might want to go ahead and turn, keep a finger there in, in numbers, but go ahead and turn over to Joshua chapter 14. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 6 says, Then the children of Judah came unto Joshua in Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephna the Kenzanite said unto him, Thou knowest the thing that the Lord said unto Moses, the man of God, concerning me and thee and Kadesh Barnea. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barda to spy out the land, and I brought him word against, again as it was in mine heart. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Watch this. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swear on that day, saying, Sure the land wherein thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years. Even since the Lord spake his word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. That's 85, by the way. As yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore, give me this mountain, whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how, that, how the Anakims were there, and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be, the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said." And Joshua blessed him and gave unto Caleb the son of Jephna 
Hebron for an inheritance. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenzanite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. And the name of Hebron before was Kerjath Arba, which Arba was the great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. All right. So we see that Caleb was a man that had faith that God would do what he had promised to do. And based on that faith, Caleb was willing to do whatever God called him to do. I mean, that was his testimony. He wholly followed the Lord his God. It's, it's in that chapter 14 three times. I believe we can also conclude that from what we read in the book of Numbers, Caleb did not have a lot of patience for those who lacked the faith to be obedient. So let's look at the man's testimony. Number one, he was a great man of faith. Joshua chapter 14, verses 11 and 12. And yet, I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now for war, both to go out and to come in. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there, and the cities were great and fenced. Now watch this. If so be the Lord will be with me, then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. That is faith in the Lord is God. That's why he was wholly following the Lord is God, because of that faith. Now let's go back to Numbers chapter 13 and verse 30. I hope I told you to keep a finger there. Verse 30 says, And Caleb stilled the people. Now the people are murmuring against him. It's like, you know, these other ten spies come in and said, Hey, there's giants in the land. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty nice land, but eh, we can't take it. Verse 30, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. Faith. Chapter 14 of Numbers, verses 7 through 9. And they spake unto all the congregation, all the company, I'm sorry, of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. So again, Caleb and Joshua had the faith to do what God had called them to do. Point number two of Caleb's character. God's testimony concerning Caleb. Go to Numbers chapter 14 and look at verse 24. This is God speaking. Let's go back to verse 20 and get our context here. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word, but as truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord, because all those men which have seen my glory and my miracles which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have tempted me now these ten times and have not hearkened to my voice, Surely they shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers, neither shall any of them that provoked me see it. Now, verse 24, But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit with him, and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. That's a promise directly from God. Caleb never forgot that either. 
So as I read that, I asked myself, how does God see me? I mean, that's a, that's a great testimony, isn't it? To have God come down before the congregation of Israel and tell them, look, ten of you guys brought in a false report from the land. You ain't going in. You're going to die in the wilderness. My boy Caleb over here, he's going in because he fully followed me. Let's look at Caleb's own testimony. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 8. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. But I wholly followed the Lord my God. So the question is, how do you see yourself? You should see yourself the way God sees you. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, and I can't spend a lot of time on it, but there is a huge number of Christians that are dealing with depression, who are dealing with a, a, a low self-esteem, and the only reason, the only reason for that is because they do not see themselves the way God sees them. I want to show you something. Go to, keep your place in Joshua, but go to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. Just going to look at one, at one verse. Verse 12. Verse 12 says, But as many as received Him, speaking of Christ, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the Son of the very living God of the universe. Amen. How can you have how can you have low self-esteem? Go to Revelation chapter 1. Because you're a son of God, there's stuff that comes with that. And it's all good. Revelation chapter 1. Let's look at verses 5 and 6. Verse 5 says that from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Look at verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. My friends, as believers in Jesus Christ, we are the sons of God. We are, look at, that, look at what it says there in verse 6, and hath made us. That's past tense. At the moment, at the moment that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you became a king and a priest. How in the world can you be depressed? How can you have low self-esteem? Look who your father is. Good night. Look at who you are. You're the son of your father. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 8 that we're joint heirs with Christ. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews and other places that Jesus Christ is seated on the throne of the right hand of God. And God has put Him over everything. Amen. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know what our inheritance is? Everything. Everything. The fourth thing of Caleb's character 
is Moses' testimony. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 9. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land whereon thy feet have trodden shall be thine inheritance and thy children's forever, because thou hast wholly followed the Lord my God. So Joshua, I'm sorry, Caleb, has a pretty good testimony. I got the testimony that I forgot to shut my phone off. Give me a second here. Okay, let this be a lesson to you. Turn your phone off. If I can figure out how. There. Okay, where was I? Okay, so Caleb has his own testimony. He has testimony from God. He has testimony from Moses. Joshua also gives the testimony of Caleb. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 14. Hebron therefore became the inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephna, the Kenzanite, unto this day, because that he wholly followed the Lord God of Israel. So all the people that were people, that were somebody, I mean, you got God, Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. So Caleb was quite a guy. He wholly followed the Lord his God. So I believe that it would be safe to say that Caleb had the character of one who was following God. But... What does it mean to wholly follow the Lord your God? Well, holy means fully, completely. But, in this case, the word translated holy also means to be filled, to be armed, and to be satisfied. So, how does that look for you and me? Well, to be filled, we need to be filled with the Spirit of God. Ephesians chapter 5, don't lose your place in Joshua. Ephesians chapter 5. <clears throat> Let's go back to verse 15. I wanted to get to verse 18, but we'll go to 15 and work our way up. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 15 says, See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Yes. All right. So, the next one is to be armed. He was filled. He was armed. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divided asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So you to be filled with the Spirit, you to be armed with the Word of God, and you are to be content. Go back to Philippians. Chapter 4 and verse 11.
where Paul says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Well, see, we can be just like Caleb and wholly follow the Lord our God. We can be filled with the Spirit of God, armed with the Word of God, and satisfied with the provision of God. But it says that he wholly followed. Followed. See, to follow means to stay behind. He wholly followed the Lord his God. In other words, he allowed God to lead him. Amen. We have to be careful in our lives that we are not attempting to lead God. Oh, I want to do this or I want to do that. And then we do it and then we go, maybe I better pray and ask God to bless this thing because it ain't working. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> it very rarely works that way. Yes. We need to follow the Lord our God. All right, amen. The word Lord is Jehovah, the existing one, the one true God. And God means the one true God. So he's following the one true God, the one true God. So the question, who is the Lord that you're following? Is the Lord that you're following the one true God? We've got to ask ourselves that question, man. How we answer it is important. We need to be honest with ourselves about it. Go to Romans chapter 6. Keep your finger in Joshua. Romans chapter 6. I got to hurry up. I haven't got through the first page yet. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So my friends, we have to be honest with ourselves. Who are we following? What are we following? And if it's not the Lord God, the one true God, then we need to change something in our lives. Caleb and Joshua took a stand for God against their entire generation. That's character. That's character. A lot of times we don't witness for the Lord our God because in our generation we might get made fun of. We might get told, well, I don't want to hear that. Who cares if you want to hear it or not? I want to say it. We need to examine ourselves and be honest with ourselves. Are we wholly following the Lord our God? So let's talk about Caleb's challenge. My friends, you need to understand if you choose to wholly follow your God, you will be challenged as Caleb was. Right. Amen. Go back to Numbers chapter 14. Challenged by his peers. Numbers chapter 14 and verse 10. But all 
the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. You know why the glory of the Lord showed up? Because God says, you are not stoning my boys. You can talk trash all you want. But when you pick up a rock, you're a dead man. My friends, the Apostle John, was, they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil. And God said, it ain't happening. I'm not done with him yet. So he was challenged by his peers. Go back to Joshua chapter 14. Look at verse 10. And now, behold, the Lord hath kept me alive, as he said, these forty and five years, even since the Lord spake, the word, the, his, whew, spake this word unto Moses, while the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now, lo, I am this day fourscore and five years old. So he had the challenge of his age. I knew that was going to preach good in this room. <laughs> Most of us face the challenge of our age. Yes. Don't get weak in the knees because you're weak in the back. Stand for the Lord. He is not done with you yet. You know how I know this? Because you're still sitting in the pews. All right, amen. If he was done with you, people would be walking by and go, wow, she really looks natural, doesn't she? <laughs> That's when God's done with you here on this earth. He's 85 years old. And he goes, God ain't done with me yet. He was challenged by the environment. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 12. He says, Now therefore give me this mountain. Let that soak in for a moment. He's 85 years old. His inheritance is a mountain. Some of us have trouble with the stairs out here. I'm just saying. Now therefore give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day for thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there and that the cities were great and fenced. If so be the Lord will be with me then I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. So not only was his inheritance a mountain it was a mountain full of giants with big fenced walled cities. That's an environmental challenge. much more than global warming and climate change. He was challenged by the giants, the Anakims, the long necks. That's what Anakim means, long necks. A tribe of giants. Have you ever wondered why in the Hollywood movies, the aliens, most of them have real long necks? They don't believe the Bible, but you can't get away from it. The giants are the offspring of Satan and his fallen angels. Some of them are long necks. So let me give you a little word just came in on top of my head right now. When you're watching the news on TV, watch some of the people and look at their necks and look at how many people that you see on TV have necks that are disproportionate to their bodies. And just let that permeate in your minds what you're seeing. I'm just saying. It could be. He's also challenged by the stronghold. 
Kirjath Arba, the city of Arba, the city that was named after the king of the giants. And we think we have problems. The fact is we do. Our adversary, the devil, has put giants in our lives as well. Ours are those things that battle against us for our minds, for our affections. Those giants set up strongholds in any area that we allow them to. Now, folks, we need to examine ourselves. We need to make sure, very sure, of what our affections are set on. The Bible tells us over in Colossians to set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. When God looks at it, our affection should be singular. And it should be set on Him. Amen. Where we mess up is we have affections. And when you put an S on the end of it, you just allowed Satan to sign it. Our affection should be singular. To wholly follow the Lord our God. That was Caleb's challenge. That's our challenge. So let's look at Caleb's conquest. Caleb never considered that he was in this thing alone. He totally believed that the victory was the Lord's. So let me ask you a question. You don't have to raise your hand and answer it. I want you to think about it. How do you view everything in life? Is the victory yours? I told you in the beginning who you are. You're a child of God. You, my friends, have a relationship with God above that which Caleb had. Because you have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. You are a child of God. Caleb wasn't. He was God's man. And I assure you that when, that when Jesus resurrected from the grave and he took the Old Testament saints with him, Caleb was right there with his sword, darn where we're going. He might not have had a sword out. But I guarantee you he was excited for another adventure. He never considered that he was in it alone. He always said, God's going with me. God promised it. I'm just going to go do what God said He was going to do. I'm going to allow Him to use me to do what He said He was going to do. God had promised him the land. We've seen that in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 24. And we've seen that again in Joshua chapter 14 verses 9 and 10. God had promised him the land. God had preserved His strength. We saw Joshua 14, 11. Look at that thing. It says, As yet I am as strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me, as my strength was then, even so is my strength now, for war, both to go out and to come in. He said, My strength hasn't abated. I'm the same man's man now at 85 that I was at 40. I'm ready to go. So God had promised him the land. God had preserved his strength. God would be with him. Look at verse 12. And now therefore, I added the end in there. Now therefore, give me this mountain whereof the Lord spake in that day. For thou heardest in that day how the Anakims were there. 
and that the cities were great and fenced, if so be, the Lord will be with me. He says, okay, so these cities are great and fenced. The Anakims are there. If that's the way it is, okay, the Lord will be with me. Then I shall be able to drive them out, as the Lord said. He goes, look, I don't care if these cities are walled and fenced and they got giants in them. God gave it to me. God's going with me. They're mine. My friends, we should look at every, every trial in our lives that way. I'm a child of God. I don't care what the giant is. I don't care what the stronghold is. I'm going to take it. Because God has promised me that. The victory is mine. I just got to claim it. That's the way Caleb was. In his mind, the victory was already won. He had this confidence based on a lifetime of seeing God give the victories to the nation of Israel when they followed Him. I guarantee you, if you've been a Christian more than 30 seconds, you can look back over your life and you can see where God has done something in your life that you thought was impossible. My salvation was something that I thought was impossible. You know the good me. Ask my wife sometime about the other me. And I ain't about to tell you. But God saved me. Something that I didn't think was possible. And since that time, He has done miracle after miracle after miracle in my life to keep me alive, to keep me going forward, to teach me the Word of God. You may not believe, that, most of you will, I'm not the brightest bulb in the chandelier. But I have the Holy Spirit of God in me and I made a promise to God. When I got saved, when I realized that I was for sure saved, I made a promise to God that I would do whatever He wanted me to do. I didn't know what that was going to be. Sometimes when I'm in my moments, I think, hey God, can I take that back a little bit? But I've had a great life, man. I've done things. I've seen things. I've been places because of my relationship with God. And it is not perfect by any stretch. But I made a deal and I've done my best to live up to it. It's been painful at times. It's cost me a lot but the rewards that I've received from it far exceed anything that I lost from it. Just to have the relationship with my wife that I now have with my wife is worth everything that I've been through as a Christian. Because it wasn't there before I became one. Look at Joshua chapter 14. So I want to talk to you about one thing and I'm running out of time. When Caleb won the battle for Kirjath Arba, he immediately changed the name to Hebron. The city went from being called the city of Arba to being Hebron, the city of shared association. From a root word meaning to have fellowship. Caleb's association, Caleb's fellowship with God gave him the victory and he made sure that that was never forgotten. Guess what? If you go to Israel today, Hebron is still there. It's still a testimony of Caleb's association, of Caleb's fellowship with God. Joshua chapter 14 and verse 15 says, And the name of Hebron before was Kirjath Arba, 
which Arba was a great man among the Anakims, and the land had rest from war. So Caleb changed the name of the city as a testimony to God. God's desire for you and for me is that we would wholly follow Him so He can give us those victories over the giants and over the strongholds in our lives so that we can enter into His rest. Take your Bibles and go back to Hebrews chapter 4. I should have told you to put your finger there before. But I didn't know if you had enough fingers or not. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 is a tremendous chapter in Hebrews. Start out here in verse 1 and we're going to read down through verse 11. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into his rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Let that verse soak in for a minute. If you're not entering into His rest, you need to understand that was already established before the world was created. God already had you there. You just won't go. Verse 4, And He spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all His works. And in his, this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So what you're saying here is, look, the nation of Israel didn't enter into God's rest because they wouldn't believe Him. They wasn't buying into what He was selling. Again, verse 7, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying to David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Therefore remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God, for he that entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So we've got 11 verses there telling us that we need to enter into God's rest. Quit doing your own stuff. That's why you're not at rest. But you ask, how do we enter into that rest? How do we realize it? See, that's the problem. We already read that God entered us in from the foundations of the world. At the moment that you finally come to your senses and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you entered into that rest. But you don't realize it. So you say, how do we realize that? How do we get there? Look at verse 12, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So when you're slipping around thinking you're doing something and God don't know it, go back and read Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13. Oh yes, He does. Verse 14, 
seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are and yet without sin. Verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You want to know how to enter into His rest? He just told you. I'm the great high priest. I was tempted in all points just like you was. But I didn't fall. So when you're tempted... Know that you can come to me. And I have the answer to your problem. I will give you rest. Amen. So if you're struggling and you got something in your life that you just can't seem to get a hold of, don't come to me. I mean, you can. And I'll talk to you and I'll take you and I will, I will direct you to the Lord God of heaven and to the throne of grace because that is where you find your answers. That is where you enter into His rest. So come to me if you want and I will take you to Him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. Father, we thank you for loving us. Father, I thank you for the testimony of Caleb. What a man. What a testimony to us, Lord, that we should be like him to wholly follow the Lord our God. And Father, when we come to those places where we see the strongholds and the giants are there, give us the wisdom, Lord, to understand that you've already given us the victory. And that we can come boldly to your throne and get the answer of how to overcome this giant. I know we didn't have time today to look at how Caleb did it. But one of these days we'll do that. But Father, what a testimony of you, of your love, of your mercy, and of your goodness, Lord. Help us, Father, to go away from this place today being like Caleb, wholly following the Lord our God. We ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.